Good evening and welcome again to Glowspan 24-7, um, our Monday night program. This evening, we are very honored to have again two important guests, um, two great sons of Guyana, no stranger to us, Mr. Timothy Jonas and Mr. Floyd Haynes. They need no introduction. Um, we want to get right into our program tonight. I want to thank Noah Singh, of course, from Glowspan 24-7 for making this platform available. And of course, Devin, our technical specialist for streaming it live and having all the comments that uh, we'll be hearing from you. And from those comments, we can ask the questions to our panelists here tonight. Uh, we want to thank our viewers for joining in. Please call your friends and your family. Let them know that we are on the air. Uh, we have a real compact one half hour program for you tonight and I'm sure it will be exciting for you. I want to start with this, gentlemen. The maxim, it never rains but pours, truly seems to be the, uh, applied to the antics of the APNU AFC coalition. For the umpteen times the courts have ruled against them, yet like a beaten out dog, he's still trying to get that bone that has slipped from his mouth. Where will this fiasco end? Or more specifically, when will this fiasco end? There's a saying that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, except of course, if that light is a bullet train coming in our way, we are definitely to be destroyed by that train. Today, we all listened um, with rapt attention to the ruling of the Chief Justice. Unlike the CCJ, she was so clear in her decision. Um, she was crystal clear. I don't want to prolong it longer. I want uh, us to hear from our legal luminary on this program, one who has earned um, great admiration to the people of Guyana. So Timothy, tell us what the Chief Justice ruled and what this ruling mean. Well, Charles, good evening. Floyd, nice to see you after a long time. Same here. Um, again, Charles, I, I noticed that we are missing anyone from the other side. Um, I, I really hope at some point you will be able to have on board on your program a representative of APNU, someone who is willing to come and defend what you have just attacked so that, so that both sides can be heard because that's the only way to have a balanced program. And I also would, would criticize your comment about beaten dogs and bones. At the end of the day, um, the APNU do represent 4 to 5% of the country. And although what they're doing is hopelessly dishonest and their attempt to deceive their own supporters so as to rally and galvanize some kind of movement um, to keep them in power for the last few days or the last few weeks is not something to be admired. I think we have to recognize the position that they hold that at the end of the day, they represent nearly half of Guyana. And before you go on, Tim, if you don't mind, um... I didn't say they're dogs, that they like dogs, be like, like beaten down dogs. I didn't call them dogs, so I hope that metaphor didn't, didn't reflect as if I call them dogs. Oh, no, of course you didn't, but I, I just wanted to make clear that um, okay, okay. Uh, what, what they are doing, what, what the leadership is doing is despicable and a betrayal of their supporters. We have to acknowledge those supporters because whether we agree with them or not, whether we think that they are blindly following or not, they are half of our country, and for me, we need a political system that recognizes and empowers that half of the country as well. And ANOG is created for the empowerment of both sides, not just one side. ANOG is created be not because we have faith in either of the two parties, but because we feel both parties have failed Guyana. So I, I, I want to keep that as a central theme in any discussion I have. Both sides have failed Guyana, and Guyana is the second poorest to Haiti, although we have so much, because of that failure by both sides. Now, 
APNU have lost a fair election. I've been saying this since the 3rd of March. Mr. Mingo rigged it. I was saying that since the 4th of March. Said it again on the 13th of March. And the truth may be inconvenient. It may be unpleasant. You mightn't like the truth. But at some point, you have to acknowledge what is the truth. And the truth is, APNU have lost his elections. They need to stop this rigmarole. They need to stop this merry-go-round that they have us on. And they need to depart. And the, the longer they take to do that, the more their supporters are realizing that they have been lied to, the more their supporters are betrayed by them, and the more they have undermined their own political plausibility, their own ability to recover, because no one likes to be lied to. And right now, nearly 200,000 people have been lied to by APNU, and more and more they are walking away because they are recognizing when your leader lies to you, you need to find another leader. Today was the last episode in a series of lies. The same lawyers who brought the Ulita Moore case, the same lawyers who brought the Eslin David case and lost both of those cases, did a cut and paste job. They took the same arguments, the same pleadings, the same prayers for relief, the same basic body of evidence that failed in Eslin David, and they brought it back again before Justice Chief Justice George. She recognized that. She identified the paragraphs of the prayers for relief, which were identical, which were similar. She didn't use the word abuse, but it was an abuse of process. You should not, having failed once, come back again. And you certainly shouldn't do it under the pretense that you're acting for a new party when it's the same lawyers and the same principal and we know who is behind the whole thing. Eslin David can't afford to go to Trinidad and hire three council and two council in Ghana. Neither could Yulita Moore, neither can Miss Jones. We know who's behind this. This thing is so thin, it's, it's pathetic. So in this last episode, the Chief Justice rejected all the propaganda nonsense that you've been hearing on NCN and you've been hearing from the propaganda machinery and AFC and APNU, all the pitiful attempts to spin what was a clear CCJ decision and the Chief Justice said, or the sixth day is valid, the recount is valid, the result of the recount is binding, the false numbers by Mingo have been correctly set aside, Keith Lowenfield, as CEO, is an employee. He's nothing more than that. He is subject to the direction and instruction of GCOM and of the chair. And when the chair said to him in her letters of 16th June, 9th July, use the recount numbers and prepare your advice, he was bound to do that. He acted unlawfully when he went and did his own thing. The Chief Justice used the expression Lone Ranger. I think she was being kind to Mr. Lowenfield. His acts have been criminal, and he needs to know that we are past the days of immunity. We are past the days when there will be no repercussions. He will be prosecuted for what he's doing because he is participating in a fraud. And he needs to understand that and make it right because he digs a deeper and deeper hole for himself as he goes along. So the Chief Justice pointed all of those things out. She pointed out that all of those had already been decided in the Ulita Moore case and in the Eslin David case, and therefore she was bound. But more than that, because there were public interest cases, the judgment stood no matter who else came to make the same applications. So the application was an abuse. No one was surprised by the decision. I don't even think um, the Attorney General the de facto attorney general or counsel for the applicants were surprised. But nevertheless, they said they are going to appeal and we know why, because it buys more time. So we are on a, at a stage where, again, the APNU supporters are being lied to, they are being given false promises, false hope held out to them. And the Court of Appeal will take a week or 10 days to rule. And at this stage, you can flip a coin to decide how the Court of Appeal will rule but I'm willing to bet money how the CCJ will rule. Um, so just to be clear, Tim, before I ask um, 
uh, Floyd to come in. What the applicant um, filed for, that was that the, C that the CEO um, should put aside the recount votes and use the tabulation that was done by the returning officers. And that was struck down. Is that what that, I'm getting? That was struck down. Those original tabulations are no longer effective. The chairman has said that they are set aside and they are not being relied on. And the chief justice said that she was entitled to do that, that order, order 60 and the recount process has gone past that stage. So we cannot go back to them. In any event, we couldn't go back to them because they were proved to have been tainted by Mingo's interference and they were proved to be unreliable. So we now have a credible and reliable count based on the recount, and that is what everybody is bound by. So Floyd, the only thing now that is left on the table, based on what has happened over the past couple of months through the legal system, is that the votes that was recounted is the only valid vote remaining. As Tim just mentioned, the returning officer's submission has been set aside. So that those, those things no longer exist. What Lowingfield did was to disenfranchise at the first time 185,000 people. Then he went back and disenfranchised 115,000, I believe. Then he went back and, and re reposit the declaration that Mingo made in region four with some different numbers again. All those things, Tim, if I'm correct, was cast aside. That's correct. This, what is remaining now, the only thing remaining is the votes that were recounted at the, at the convention center. So what what is there that they have to appeal, um, <laughs> Floyd? Well, um, there is nothing. I think the CCJ has been unequivocal. Um, Chief Justice Roxanne George, unequivocal. None of this is new. None of this is new. But I would say it doesn't really, it didn't require a court order for us to determine who won the election. There are several stories. First, the coalition claimed they won. Then they agreed to a recount and they said the recount would show that they won. Then as the recount got on the way, they said there were irregularities. We may have to discard uh, the, the entire election. Then the recount was concluded. They say, let's wait for the uh, CARICOM's report. CARICOM's report says uh, recount was credible. Then they said, well, we win with because we win based on valid votes. Then the very next day he said, well, we win based on valid votes, but not the same numbers yesterday. And then finally, they said, well, we let's go back to Mingo's recount. Now, any sane person, all of these things can't be true. And a winner doesn't behave that way. So it's clear to me that there is something else afoot. What concerns me is that I believe that the coalition has taken a position that they're not going anywhere. I don't see how, I mean, uh, Chairman Justice Singh, retired Justice Singh, has asked for the report several times. Um, her employee or the one person that reports to her has come back questioning, <laughs> seeking clarification. The CCJ has ruled, the High Court has ruled, and they haven't gone. I think it is, I don't want to say hopeless. But as I said earlier on, I am a former chess player and I play moves in advance. And I'm already at the CCJ ruling and I'm asking the question, then what? I think perhaps we are afraid to confront the obvious. What if they don't go? It is a serious question and we should start taking that seriously. Well, Floyd, you're a friend of the coalition. I mean, I know you're friends a lot of people in Guyana, but you were um, not a, not interior involved in their, you know, what they're doing. But you have some friends there. I mean, have you talked to them about 
I mean, as, as Tim mentioned, Dominic seems to be the only sane person within the Apple AFC. And he's telling them, guys, stop fooling your supporters. Stop doing the shenanigans. Accept defeat. Move on. Get a way out. This ruling should have given them a way out as well. But they're I, not prepared I, to do that. Charles, I don't think they're looking for a way out. Let me try to contextualize this if I can. I think, I think it doesn't help to um, dismiss uh, a lot of what these guys are doing, um, although I emphatically disagree with all of it. Let me try to put it in context, um, and then I will sort of try to undermine their, their way of thinking, their logic. There are several things working in tandem, um, and at times they are interwoven. There is what I call the victimization and marginalization fear. And what this is, it's the fear that when your side lose, the winner will victimize and marginalize your group. This fear exists on the Indian side, it exists on the black side. It is real, it is palpable. The second fear is not so serious, but it is this fear of sovereignty. And that is a lot of people have argued that they worry that Guyana's sovereignty will be undermined by a corrupt and weak government. Each think the other is corrupt and weak. And then finally, there is the political fear, or the fear of the political class, and their fear is even less important. It's the fear of the loss of privilege, power, perks, and prestige. Now, the political class has hijacked the other two fears. Now, Along comes the discovery of oil. The discovery of oil has exacerbated those fears. It has made them worse. Because what it, what it pretends to do is align power and money in the hands of a state. And it is against that backdrop that the supporters and the defenders of APNU justify their actions. They have calculated that to not concede, to create a narrative built in lies, cheating, and deceit is a lesser evil than to have those fears manifest. I think it's profoundly wrong and short-sighted. But that puts in context, sort of, it explains some of the behavior, and it tells you where this is going. They see, they have appointed themselves, they, the political class, as the de facto a uh, spokesperson for the, legitima the legitimate fears of these people. Now, here's the problem with that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wind down. First of all, they don't speak for the people. That's the first uh, problem with that. Uh, secondly, nothing good can be created or sustained without a moral and ethical foundation. And so even if, even if your intent, and by the way, I doubt whether the methods and the tactics will achieve the objectives they're contemplating, but even if it were to, you have to build that thing on something solid and morality and ethical um, type things. And finally, and this is the worst, it is in the time of severe stress that we seem especially willing to grant extraordinary powers to individuals and give away our freedom. And that tends to lead to dictatorship. In Guyana, we're doing that under the guise of ethnic insecurity. It's okay for us to grant these extraordinary powers. And I fear that what we have in the making is a Guyana tragedy. It is very, very bad. Well, well put, Floyd. But the question is this, and um, the world has changed. If the PPP goes into office and implement policies that will do exactly the opposite of what you just said, ethnic problem and all these things, the world will not sit by idly. The world has changed. I mean, this will not be allowed to happen, regardless if APNU would continue in government. I think they, they would have to change their policies because they were getting into that ethnic dominance as well. Um, if the PPP go and reverse that and start put their their own ethnic dominance, 
I think the world will react differently. Even the, the local guys in Guyana, like Tim and the other new parties, they will raise hell in Guyana. Oh, so, including me. I will. I totally agree. It's, but I don't think the, the folks who are de defying the orders of the court believe that. I totally agree with you. I think they've got it exactly wrong. Tim, Sonia Rodriguez asked a question, and I want to preempt that with today I was kind of shocked when the Chief Justice said that the CEO and the Attorney General arguments are hopelessly flawed. I can imagine the shiver that went down the Attorney General's back when he hear those words from the Chief Justice that your arguments are so flawed. You have been an attorney, I'm sure you know how that, that would have hurt, you know, for, especially for the Attorney General. But what Sonia is saying, couldn't the Chief Justice put an end to this today instead of sending it back to the chair to make that decision? Did she make it clear that the only thing that we said in this program was the numbers from the recount and that's it? That's, that's a difficult question. The Chief Justice's judgment was restrained and very, very careful. If you look at the language she used, she didn't reinvent the wheel. She used the language of the CCJ and she used the language to a lesser extent of the Court of Appeal in Ulita Moore in her assessment of the history, the background, the factors involved and the issues arising. She did not stray to speculate as to rights and wrongs. She kept strictly on legal issues before her. In one area, I found her judgment courageous in her discussion of the issue of res judicata and in her determination that the litigation was public interest litigation. Now, that is in contradistinction to if I sue Floyd, you know, for $15 for the mangoes that um, I sold him and he didn't pay me. That's between me and Floyd, that's private. But public interest litigation is litigation that affects all of us as a country. And where you have public interest litigation, the principle more easily arises that the determination by a court of that public interest litigation, such as Julie Tamour, such as Leslie David, binds all of us. We shouldn't, Carl Sugrim shouldn't be able to go back to court to reinvent that, to reopen those issues. They are closed for the whole country. I appreciated the approach she took there, and I would like to see how the Caribbean court deals with it. But other than that, her decision was careful, it was precise, and I don't think she I don't think she stepped wrong yet. My one reservation is when she entertained the whole discussion about a stay and an undertaking and that kind of thing. Because having dismissed an application, there was nothing left before her, and she could very easily have said that has nothing to do with me. There's no order that can possibly be made and there wasn't. Um, so file your appeal and if you want, but you have to give the Chief Justice credit for consistency because she recognized that Claudette Singh, half the country will not like it, but Claudette Singh, when the Ulita Moore litigation started, even before that, when the Holodar litigation started on the 3rd of, of March, when Mingo started his nonsense, Claudette Singh said she will not go further until the litigation is decided. She was consistent in Holodar. She was consistent with Ulita Moore. She was consistent with Eslyn David. She's waiting for the court to decide. So she cannot be criticized for doing that now. And the Chief Justice really cannot be criticized for asking Ms. Kim Kite if that is the intention of the chief of um, Claudette Singh. She didn't express an opinion one or another. She just asked if that was the intention. So even to that, although I didn't like it, I can't offer it as a criticism. It's just more conservative than I would have been. But I do not think that the good chief justice stepped awry a single time today. But that's that's the problem we have. You got, I didn't hear the end there and the, the voice went down. But Tim, that's the problem we're having is that the court is making rulings, but the ruling seems to be so broad that it's interpreted by different factions, right? The thing is, um, if she had said that this court will now rule 
that the CEO shall or must, whatever the legal term is, present to the chairman the result of the election based on the signed copies of the statement of recount that was authenticated at the convention center. Could she have said that? Did we lose him? A, oh. a, a judge wields a lot of power, but you have to be careful where you draw the line over that that judge's gavel has and the judgment that a dictator or a despot has. A dictator or a despot does what he wants, and if you don't like it, he clothes you. But a judge acts within the confines of the law and implements and applies the law. Now, nobody before Justice George has asked her for any mandamus commanding um, Lowenfield to do anything. There's no application before her for that. So she can't make that kind of order. She would be outside of it to pretend to make orders that no one has asked her to make. She operated strictly applying the law. And the law is all we have. The law is what says that the people of Guyana are sovereign and not Mr. Granger. And it is that law that is being broken when APNO is trying to stay in power, although they've lost an election. If we deviate from the law, and if she deviates from the law, then we are no better than, than they are. So Floyd, what I'm hearing from Tim, if I'm hearing correctly, is that Chief Justice did not rule to demand of the CEO to present the numbers based on the recount. So this now goes to the CCJ, as we all anticipate to go to them. I, I don't know if the appeal court will will declare that they have no. There's sorry, nothing. Sir, to to listen. To. In, sorry. In her decision, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but in, in her decision, in her reasons, the Chief Justice did say that Lowenfield is bound to follow the directions of the chair, chair. just as the CCJ had said. She said That's that. Said. But That's exactly right. She did not make any order him to do so because no one made an application for such an order. Remember, we were respondents. We were the defense. We didn't go. We went to answer the claim that's, by Ms. Jones. So she made the yeah. only order that she could lawfully make, which is to dismiss that claim. But in her reason, she did say that Lowenfield is bound to apply the recall numbers to obey the directions of the chair. And that's my point. You're totally, I'm in sync with that. But the, prop, the thing is this. This goes to the appeal court. Whatever the appeal is, I really don't know. Nobody seems to know what the appeal should be. And then from there, maybe go to the CCJ. Then Mr. Lowenfield go and submit a separate, different report. Then what? Then the, then the winner of the election goes to the court to now demand what you're saying, Tim? I mean... <laughs> that's, that, Charles, that's exactly where I was, where I was going <laughs> earlier. I mean, we have to do this as a thought experiment because you can play this out already. Um, nothing, the CCJ has already said that, um, um, retired, um, chair Justice Singh has said that, used the numbers from, he hasn't done it. Uh, my question, uh, for Tim is, can chair, chairwoman Singh make a declaration without Lowenfield's report, without a report from CEO Lowenfield? This this question has come up a lot, and as, as we discussed before we formally went live, the the interesting thing about the setup, as I saw Jeremy John called it an impasse, is that Lowenfield works for GCOM. He is the secretariat, he's an employee. Article 162 and 18 of, of the election law says that he is an employee subject to the inland direction of GCOM. The Chief Justice said so today. And GCOM has the right to hire and fire their employees, including temporary employees and permanent employees such as Low and Field. I can't have any impasse with my employee. I'm nope. sorry, it doesn't work like that. So when you have an impasse with your employee, the solution is very quick. Low and Field went, I have no doubt, at the end of June, having disobeyed the letter of the 16th of June, to collect his fat salary from GCOM. There is no way in my book Lowenfield should be going at the end of July to collect any salary from GCOM. Lowenfield should be fired long before that, and somebody else should be in his place to present the advice according to the law that the CCJ and the Chief Justice have said he must supply, 
if he doesn't do it, there are plenty of other people in Guyana happy to take that salary and do it properly. And there is no way he should still be on the job having defied GCOM for the last four weeks. Yeah, I thought after the CCJ's ruling and uh, chairperson's direction, um, that was very clear. And his response to that was immediate grounds for termination. It was insubordinate, clear and simple. Now, it could be that the, the chair was indulging and allowing the law to take its place. But, but I'm getting back to this point. You can very easily see a scenario where this, th this thing comes all the way back around. Um, Lowenfield refuses to submit a report in, in line with the recount. Uh, I, I don't think he will, based on everything I've seen. There's nothing that I've seen so far that would lead me to believe that he's going to wake up next week and do it. He won't do it. So then does the chair take that bold step and terminate Lowenfield? And then who steps in? The deputy? I mean, I, I'd like for this to play out because I don't think, I don't think you're going to get the resolution here in the courts. We have to go through the process. It is what is required. I respect the system and it gives us legal cover. But for all practical purposes, how does this get resolved? I have not heard anybody said that. This will not, to my mind, be resolved with a court order. I hope to God I'm wrong. But, I, but that nothing back, that I've seen, nothing that I've seen suggests to me that that's where this is going to go. And those are so valid points. And Tim made an excellent point um, in his last in his statement. There are a lot of people out there, and I know some of the guests on this show, they're, they're high in praise for Madam Chair, the, the, you know, Claudia Singh. But I really, like Tim just said, I don't know if Tim will want to go that far, but I think this fiasco that we are in rests squarely at the feet of the chairman of the commission. She could have ended this a long time ago. She could have ended it since, since March the 4th when she could have demanded that either Mingo do his work through, of course, the CEO, or he's fired. And if he doesn't want to implement it, then she should put her foot down. But she didn't do that. She was missing in action. So she keep delaying, delaying. And, and, I, and I keep saying this, that she's putting meetings at 2.30 in the afternoon, giving, <laughs> giving up to AFC enough time to go to the court and the thing is, it's so well, the, the, the band, the orchestra is so well played that Lowing Field know that a court mat is coming. All the APNU commissioners know that a court mat is coming. So they all work in coordination. And I, my gut feeling is, and I might be wrong, but the chairman of the commission is playing a double agent game. She is telling everyone what they want to hear. And she thinks that's fine, but she's playing with the entire nation. I don't think she quite understand that. So she could have ended it, as Tim said, she could have fired Lowen Field long ago. She didn't do it. She's giving him time and time and time. And as you said, um, Floyd, if Lowen Field is fired, do they have to promote uh, Myers? I don't yeah. think so. I don't think so. She can appoint somebody else. You know, the commission can. Four persons come to the decision, they appoint someone else and do that report. But I think we're, we're, we're round and round in circles and I don't know what can happen. Before we go to break, gentlemen, um, I know Tim has always been saying that, you know, this 45% of the other side, I really believe that percentage has gone down substantially. I don't think this 45% support after AFC anymore. There's a, there's, a, there's a huge chunk has been taken off, and I hope that they come to your party, Tim, and to their parties so that they can represent them more forcefully. But of recent, Mr. Harriman, after the um, after the the Americans and um, the U.S. Secretary of State announced the visa revocation, he went on record to say that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was not informed of any decision. But this is not a government-to-government -government arrangement. This is the U.S. government revoking individual visas. So you don't have to go to the, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I'm surprised that um, Mr. Harman will make such a statement. But then Mr. Nagamoto himself also said that this too will pass us. What do you guys understand by those statements? Floyd, you want to go first? I found it 
unless these guys are tied into some special knowledge that I'm aware of, I find those statements to be profoundly naive. I don't understand how in 2021 you can take on the entire world and, su and survive. This is not the 20th century where the Cold War was in vogue and you can seek comfort, you can be a bad guy or a bad person and seek refuge under one of the two um, Cold War um, competitors. This is a different world and every, all and sundry have come out against what the coalition is doing. Um, to, I can't for the life of me, I've been talking to some of my colleagues, I'm missing something. Because I don't see how when all is said and done, the few people that's leading the coalition can stick their heads in the sand and give the entire world the finger. It's unexplainable. But I think those comments are profoundly naive because that's not how the superpowers operate. Tim, what are your comments? You know, Floyd gave a description of the three issues involved in our ethnic politics, and it would be hard to improve on that. The, the first one that he mentioned was the, the fear of marginalization and victimization. And then the second one he mentioned was sovereignty. And he pointed out that the two parties use those two themes to empower themselves. And that is where we're going now, you see, that those two themes, marginalization and sovereignty, they're both lies. Yep. The thing with sovereignty is that Guyana is a sovereign nation, but that sovereignty doesn't equal David Granger. That sovereignty doesn't equal Irfan Ali. The sovereignty belongs to us, the people. People. And APNU are not the country. APNU are not kings. They're not monarchs and royalty. Right now, they're trespassers. So if anybody comes to support the democratic process, they are assisting our sovereignty. They're not interfering with it. Because if you have a situation where a minority unlawfully seizes power or unlawfully retains power, that minority has destroyed the sovereignty of the country. That minority has destroyed the people's will, and it's the people who are sovereign. So your the argument, the spin, the propaganda segues into this, oh, these terrible foreigners. And, and there's a racist element too, because they're colonials and they're white and they're rich and they're privileged and all of that. So there's a racist element in it. They're coming to interfere with our sovereignty because they don't want to see people like us ruling. And that galvanizes an emotional response based on patriotism, based on racial pride. And they use these good concepts, these good things, patriotism, racial pride, pride in, in self, and they twist it into something to perpetuate their own illegal tenure in office. And that's what's going on. So it's a lie. This has nothing to do with sovereignty. This got to do with people trespassing in the office of the president right now. People who should not be there and who are interfering with my sovereignty. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, let me come back. I want to talk about how did we get here? And we keep, we keep saying that the two parties basically do what they want, but they cannot do what they want unless they're elected. And the people of Guyana continue to elect these two parties. So how do we get away from that? And and I, I don't blame the people again. We keep, you know, we, we think that the people are, are, are not clever, but the people know what they're doing. But in doing what they're doing, it is creating this conflict that doesn't seem to have no end. And yet we go to the polls and continue to vote for these two heads, whatever you want to call them, and the problem continues. So when we come back, let us discuss how do we get here and how can we get out of where we are.
So we'll be back shortly. Travis Van is now pleased to offer train packages to Niagara Falls from New York City. This three days, two night getaway to Niagara Falls will include round trip coach tickets, two nights hotel accommodations, admissions to the Skyland Tower Observatory deck, and the voyage to the fall boat ride. For this and many more train packages from New York City, call Travel Span at 718-845-0437. That's Travel Span, 718-845-0437. Travel plans? Call Travel Span, your train vacation specialist. Globespan 24-7 continues its efforts to serve the communities. The platform provides for all sides to air their views and discuss solutions. Viewers in Guyana and across the world are participating in these discussions. Globespan's platform offers Guyanese an opportunity to express their concerns and discuss solutions in the political realm, thereby addressing the polarized situation. Discussions also include social ills, such as alcoholism, domestic violence, suicides, and much more that have been plaguing the nation. Globespan 24-7 platform connects the diaspora and the world with Guyana. The concept is helping to shape the development of Guyana. So Globespan 24-7 needs your support to continue to serve the communities. Go to Globespan247.com and pledge your support with from as little as $5, $10, $15, or $20 or any amount each month. Your support will help and go a long way to develop Globespan 24-7 as an independent platform that brings in all sides for the communities. By including all sides, we can bring long-lasting changes for all Guyanese. Log on to Globespan 24-7 today and pledge your support. <laughs> okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are having sort of a lively discussion talking about the Chief Justice ruling today. And... Uh, the way forward from there. In this program, we have had many discussion, this and other program on Globespan 24-7. There is the perception out there, whether it's real or, or, or imagined, is that the Indians by and large vote for the PPP. And as some of our commentators have been saying that um, if that is true, then the PP has an edge in the race. You know, we talk about um, they have a, a heads up. Yeah. Um, if that is true, and then we said the African Guyanese vote more the PNC. Um, there's a huge mix percent um, Guyanese in the middle, and of course the Amerindian vote. And over the years, we have seen, um, and and Dr. Rose has really pointed this out quite eloquently is that small parties do not last more than two or three election cycle. The United Force, we know the history of that. I mean, with the, with the, with the rigged election, no one could have survived. And that's a, that's a fact. But with the, with, the, with the coming to being of the AFC, the Guyanese in the middle, and Timothy was part of the AFC, I was part of the AFC, we all support that middle ground, hoping that we would have brought um, the two major parties to their senses. The rest is now history. AFC, in their own knowledge, thought that joining with APNU, they would have um, brought the PP to an end because of in their in their book the PP was doing all this corruption and all these different things. Now, in the eyes of the guy, and he's based on the last election. They don't seem to trust the third parties anymore because even though you go and preach to them, Jesus Christ is coming. Even though you preach the best message out there, they're saying, you know what? You will do exactly what AFC did. So we can't trust you. So what do people have to do? They got to go back and vote for these two uh, major parties. So the question, gentlemen, how did we get here? Did what I just said summarize it or there's much more deeper feeling than, than what I just said. Tim, you want to start? I, I actually don't agree with your premise, Charles. And I'm glad you raised it because it, it's an interesting peculiarity 
of how Guyana has evolved politically. You're right, and I agree with this. First of all, don't let's color it, don't let's rose tint it. PPP APNU politics is race politics. There is ethnic alliance on both sides. Yep. There, both parties are grounded, their support base is ethnically loyal to them. And there's no way to twist it or turn it. I'm, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I, I hear people talking about, um, oh, why you do introduce race to this conversation when we're talking policies and all of that, blah, blah, nonsense. Let's accept the reality. The two groups are race-based. Now there's a swing vote. And that is what was demonstrated in 06, 11, 15, and now in 2020. But look at the numbers on the swing vote. At the height of what was perceived as PPP corruption, PPP venality, um, when they had been in office for 19, 23 years and the corruption was rampant, they were losing, they were still getting 32 seats in parliament. They were losing that majority by 5,000 votes. So let us agree that numerically speaking, the worst that the PPP will do because of the number of absolute PPP loyalists is 50% less 5,000 votes. That's the worst they will do. That is that is their core base. APNU doesn't have that luxury. APNU has maybe a 40,000 deficit on that because what we saw in 2015 and in 2011 and then in 2015 is APNU AFC combined in 2015 were able to win by 5,000 votes. Now, when you say that it was a two-party race, you're right, but I think that's because the majority of Guyanese were so disgusted with the excesses of APNU that they just decided we want these people out. But even with that premise, if you look at the numbers, 10,000 people voted for small parties. So of the AFC core, and AFC had maybe 30 to 35,000, 10,000 remained with third parties. And only 15,000 was the PPP victory over, over APNU. So you still have enough of a swing vote that if PPP does not do their job, I don't think they get a majority next election. In fact, I'm certain that they don't. And another thing that people have realized this election is that the problem that exists, the problem in GCOM, the problem with the winner take all, the problem with this fight and this polarization is a two party problem. It's not all on one side. I think that has been recognized. And when you look at where the fight was, you see how powerless really the PPP has been. They can protest and make noise and, and all of that. But Mr. Granger is still in office. If the shoe was the on, on the other foot, the PPP wouldn't be in office all this time. Very true. So we need to understand our dynamics in Guyana, but also we need to appreciate that at long last, there is a large enough middle class, a large enough group of independent thinkers who are willing to vote along policies and are recognizing the harm in both parties. And in this election, this go round, those independent thinkers have seen the flaws in the system authored by the two parties. I don't think we're in a two-party game anymore. I'm I'm very excited to see what the next few years bring and the next election cycle brings. I don't think this is going to be a two-party system anymore. Fly, before you come in, um, I just want to men just piggyback on what Timothy just said there. Um, even though we don't like what is going on now with the political impasse. As I said in this program many times, behind every dark cloud is a silver lining. And what you said there, Tim, I think the PP understands that going into government, there is no guarantee they will win a majority again if they don't perform. They're very conscious that the small parties, leaders like you and, and all the other parties like Asha and, and, and Rhonda and, and Lennox and so on, they have now, you have now taken on a new dimension in Guyana and people are looking at you and the other leaders because they see leadership qualities. 
So if the PBP in office do not perform, they're going to be, as you said, in serious trouble in the next election. But Floyd, um, how did we get here? Well, um, in large part, it's because of the winner-take-all system. That, is a, that explains a big part of it. Because in a winner-take-all model, um, the loser sees an existential threat to his or her um, survival. And therefore, they will pull all the stops to prevent the winning side. Now, Timothy is right. If the shoe was in the other foot, it would not have gone on this long because they don't control the disruptive or the coercive powers of the state. Um, APNU does, and that's why it can do this. Uh, but let me revisit. I totally agree with, with Tim. I think that binary system is changing. Uh, in 2011, um, the PPP was a minority government. In 2015, they lost. Power shifted. And in 2020, it shifted back. In spite of the, of the ethnic, uh, the large ethnic voting bloc, there is a, a vigilant middle that is prepared to hold governments accountable. And part of why I think um, the coalition lost is because they failed to address the needs of various constituents. Plain and simple. There was gross incompetence on many parts, and then they failed to address some of the needs of some of the constituents. The smaller parties, I think, um, will do very, very well. And people say, well, you know, we just had the election and nobody voted for the smaller parties. It's very unfair. Um, I think these small parties had not had enough time to develop and hone their message. One election does not a party make. You don't start a party in an election year and go out. I mean, all things considered, I would say they did well. But what I'm arguing is that with enough time and the right message, I think there will be a middle that's up for grabs. They will still have the large ethnic blocks. But the party that's responsible and responsive to the needs of the people will be able to influence that middle into coming over and hence winning the election. But having said that, but having said that you need a single third force. Right now, we have, what, about six or seven new parties that make up that third force, so it's not a third force, it's a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. I, do I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in those ready-made type third force type things. I, I, I think competition is good, it's healthy. I mean, go out there and make your case to the Guyanese people. Present your case, develop your message, and sell it. And, and you know, I, I don't believe in, I, I have a problem with arbitrary force type things, power sharing, third force, these type things that you sort of impose from, from the top. I think the individual parties, over a period of time, if they stay the course, will do very well. And they will do exceptionally well if the incumbent government is not meeting the needs of the constituents. I think these are changing times. And I like that. And Tim, and I think we get into the same discussion many times in this program, is that our constitution as it stands today cements this ethnic voting. As we, we know, we fought Article 1772. We talk about so often, I think all of us will become attorneys when this thing is over. Okay. Um, it says that the party with the most vote win the presidency. That's the prize. So yeah. if, if that article is removed from our constitution and you can have post-correlation government like all over the Commonwealth, Guyana is the only unique place, I believe, in this arrangement. Um, anywhere across the Commonwealth, you can um, have post-election correlation. In Guyana, you have to do it before, like Timothy, TNM, and um, Anog, and, and LJP, they form a post, what, for the purpose of seat allocation, not for the government. So even though these three parties together if they had won more votes than the other two parties, they still couldn't form the government because their list did not gather enough votes. And that's individual list I'm talking about. 
So, Tim, will that be one of the chopping block in the next in this next administration, um, in the next parliament, that that article one seventy seven two must be removed? Well, is is the offender if you're talking about um, coalitions? It's not one seventy seven two, but don't don't let's get into legalese about it. I know what you're talking about. You're asking about forming coalitions after the election. And I agree with you, it's popular throughout the world, lots of places you can do it. But here's why I'm not a good politician, Charles. I don't agree with it, and I'll tell you why. Our reality in Ghana is that at the end of the day, 7 to 80 percent of the people are polarized. And when you speak to them on an individual basis, they are all reasonable, well-intentioned people. But if they're afro guyanese chances are they will tell you they will never vote for that man Bharat. And if they are indo guyanese they will never vote for that man Danger Granger. Now, if you take that reality on board, so a well-intentioned member of the society, hardworking, might be willing to go and vote for a third party because he, he recognizes the failings of his own party, the party of his ethnic loyalty but he'll never go and vote for those evil people on the other side. You compromise his position if you persuade him to give you his vote, and then you go and form a coalition with those evil people on the other side. If you truly believe that sovereignty belongs to the people, you have to recognize and respect the wish of the electorate. And if the electorate feels strongly about something like that, you should not be in a position to surprise them after the election by going and jumping on a bandwagon with a party that they might never want to see in office. That is our peculiarity in Ghana. And I think it's something, although we don't agree with it, although ethnic voting is a problem and it's harmful, we have to address it frontally by education and by showing people a better way, but we should not uh, try to address it by making some change in the constitution so that after we get a vote, we can go and jump on a bandwagon with the people that they never want to see in power. I, I don't think we should undermine the will of the electorate that way. Floyd? Um, I have to disagree a little bit by my attorney and friend. Jim is my attorney. <laughs> um, but I here is the scenario. Let's assume you, me, and Tim enter the race. I get 30%. Tim gets 30%, you get 40%. You have a plurality, although you don't have a majority. Um, what happens in the Guyana context, you get to go off and form the government, which you're 40%. It seems patently unfair, just on its surface. How, why, would you, why should you be able to form the government when there is a 60% of the people that didn't vote for you? That's the problem, I think, with the current winner winner take all model and the model that allows the government with a plurality of votes to go off and form the government the government should represent all of its people and however you get there it shouldn't be forced but you can do some horse trading and whatnot so i i, I disagree slightly with tim on that and you know that's there's room for conversation and disagreement that's what it's all about yeah except that no yeah. matter yeah no but matter if you've got the, even if you got 60% because you've negotiated some coalition with a large party and a small party, you're still not pretending that you're acting for all the parties. Well, I'm going because to that point. It's 40% when, when still AFC, not. When yeah. AFC formed the coalition with APNU, I don't think anyone is deceived that they are acting for all of Guyana. And if yeah. they had formed a coalition with PPP, they weren't, wouldn't have been acting for all of Guyana. Yeah, but Our that's problem. Not... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Our, our problem is exactly what you're talking about, that with a two-party system, the winner controls parliament, and therefore you have an elected dictatorship so that they make the laws to give themselves more power. That's what we saw Barnum do. That's what we saw the PPP do when they got in power until they were in a minority. And when they were in a minority, we'll notice suddenly parliament started passing laws that the Ramatar government refused to assent to. That is when you had an independent parliament. So I actually think it might be more healthy, especially given the rules of the game. The rules of the game right now are winner take all, and neither of the two parties will agree to change it. 
Yeah. So if you're playing with these rules, if you're playing football with these rules, I think it might be a good idea to play football and try and get a minority government so that at least parliament is independent and you could start changing those laws, the petroleum laws, the energy agency laws, the laws that give the government a di dictatorial powers and give it to make it more widespread, allow an independent parliament to make laws truly to represent the will of the people. So what you're advocating, Tim, is a, is a minority government in perpetuity, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that with the rules of the game now, Charles, to change the constitution, you need two thirds. So APNU and PPP got to agree. They haven't agreed for 53 years. So if these are the rules of the game that you have winner take all, the way to make an inroad with these rules is to have a third party or a fourth and a fifth that ensure a minority government so that at least parliament, your lawmaking body, is independent of the government. Look, let's, let's talk the truth in our system. Government has 51%, as, as Irfan Ali's government will. He can make the laws because he controls parliament. parliament. So he can continue all of those laws that give his ministers the power, power to central housing, power to give themselves land if they want because they control central housing, power to award um, petroleum blocks because they control, um, they pass the law to give themselves control of that. But more than that, power to decide who's on the Judicial Service Commission, so they appoint judges. Power to decide who to appoint for GPL, for GAIWA, for all of those commissions. The, the dictatorship that is elected isn't just confined to the executive and parliament. It starts to infiltrate all the areas, the judiciary, the public service, the police. We've just seen changes in the police force, in the, the promotions. We've seen changes in the army, in the promotions. As soon as the executive can infiltrate all of those areas, you have an absolute dictatorship. And the only way to change that with the rules of the game now, make sure parliament is independent so that the opposition in parliament can try to restrain those excesses. Okay, Tim, when this, um, the new government is sworn in and things are back to normal, I will really want to bring you back on this channel. So let's talk about real constitutional reform, what our constitution should be like. And maybe Floyd can help us in that process as well. And we need to get our heads together to have a, a country that will work, whether it's a minority government or a government for the people and all the people. When we come back, we want to talk about the OAS and CARICOM is meeting tomorrow and Guyana is on their agenda. Um, what are our views about the organization, American State, which I think made up of like um, almost 100 something countries? Um, together of all the other Commonwealth and OAS and CARICOM. Um, they're meeting tomorrow and Guyana is on the agenda. So when we come back, let's talk about that. Okay. Hey America, let's put fun back into the summer with safe train vacation packages to Washington DC from New York City. That's right, you heard it. Travis Span got your train vacation packages from New York City to Washington, D.C. This four days, three nights trip will include round trip coach train tickets, three nights hotel accommodations, a multi-day hop on hop off sightseeing tour of Washington, D.C. and a Monuments by Moonlight tour. You heard it here first, Travis Span is offering train vacation packages this summer. Call Travis Pan at 718-845-0437 for rates and more information. That's 718-845-0437 and let's explore closer to home this summer. Travel plans, Travis Span. Having trouble finding a location to grow your business? We have the perfect space available for retails, offices, and apartments. We are located at 3A North Road between Wellington and Cam Street. Contact us today on 624-0692. That's 624-0692 for more information. Take the family or maybe go with friends on a train getaway to Boston and Cape Cod. Explore Boston City with a multi-day hop on hop off bus tour where you can immerse yourself in its rich history and New England charm.
Then take the Provincetown Ferry over to Cape Cod. The quaint villages, serene beaches, and renowned seafood restaurants will make you never want to leave. This Boston and Cape Cod package includes round-trip coach tickets to Boston, the Provincetown Ferry, and three nights hotel accommodation. So book Boston and Cape Cod with Travelspan. It has something for everyone. Call Travelspan to book at 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. And book your Boston and Cape Cod train getaway today. Okay, welcome back, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Tim had some technical difficulty with his system, so we are trying to get him back. Um, but I'm glad you're still with us as we continue this program. And of course, Floyd is, is here. Oh, Tim is back? Yeah. Um, Tim, we are hearing you, but we're not seeing you. Hello. Yeah. Um, okay, there you are. Um, Gentlemen, um, before we went to break, we we knew that um, tomorrow the organization American State and CARICOM is meeting, and on their agenda is Guyana, the Guyana situation. Now, a couple of things I want you guys to speculate. We don't know what they will talk about, but most likely they will talk about if the United States Canada, the United Kingdom, the European Union impose travel restrictions on some of the persons who they perceive um, as a, causing uh, this election fiasco. Should the OAS and CARICOM yeah, also Facebook. follow yes. through? Uh, uh, no. Tim, you hearing us? Sorry, Floyd, are you hearing us? I'm hearing you. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah, Floyd, you want to start there? Uh, yes, I think it's um, it's very important that um, both bodies are meeting. Um, but you know, this the, the, from a geopolitical standpoint, the the the, the big governance of governments have spoken. The U.S. have spoken. The EU, the U.K. And Canada. <clears throat> They've, uh, the U.S. have gone a step further. They've started to impose individual sanctions. Now, what can we expect from OAS and CARICOM? You know, I've been, well, I've been hearing about this stuff. I don't run around on, on Facebook as much. But there's people, there's chatter on Facebook, of, you know, people saying, we Guyana, we don't need CARICOM, we don't need this. We can just exist. We can be a law unto ourselves. I mean, can you imagine the idiocy of that? Do you know how many Guyanese work in Barbados? I mean, what if a Guyanese couldn't get on a plane and fly to... I mean, th this is the kind of stuff that's being promoted. Um, but I want to say this. All of the international bodies are being tested. And they're being tested in a real way. They have come out very, very strong and have condemned what is going on. They're going to have to back that up. They're going to have to back that up. And what course that will take, I don't know. But they just cannot come out as strong as they have and then allow a few people to defy the will of the majority of Guyanese people. They're going to have to take some kind of action. I don't know how much action CARICOM and OAS can take. Um, Tim, what's your take on that? I'm afraid I, I fell off your call, so I, I only came in at the last part. Yeah, we are talking about tomorrow, CARICOM and the OS, their meeting, and Guyana is on the agenda. What do we see? Are they coming up with a definitive action against Guyana or the leaders in Guyana who they think um, is perpetuating fraudulent election? I think we can only speculate. I, I don't have enough information. I don't know internally what influences them, um, where their lobby comes from. I have absolutely no doubt that the ABC countries have an enormous influence on what they do. Um, having interacted with Ms. Maya Motley and Mr. Gonzalez, I, I am of the view that having 
come personally and being involved here, they are going to take it as a personal slight if their involvement doesn't produce the desired result. So I, I believe that CARICOM will make some strong statements, but at the end of the day, statements are hot here. And I'm not sure what CARICOM can do that would really have any real impact on Guyana, um, on APNU. Maybe the OAS as a larger group, but if they begin to isolate us economically, which is what we're talking about, we all suffer. I really hope it doesn't come to that. We need to vote long before then. All right. Well, we we I think um, as, as as Floyd mentioned, I don't think that CARICOM and the OS will make specific statement and then don't back it up with something very strong. I think they they might follow the um, the ruling of the U.S. and Canada and, and the U.K. and so on and maybe restrict travel to, to those persons. Now, I want to talk about finances in Guyana. And this is, seems to be, um, says Narayan Singh wrote a beautiful article today about his quandamania of the Granger administration for the past five years. What we have seen is, I don't know if it's, a, if it's an ethnic problem because for these two parties, we agree are ethnic based. Is it a philosophy problem? Is it a problem of managing finance? I mean, Floyd, you're a very successful businessman. You're African origin and you have done very well. Tim is of mixed ancestry and I, I'm sure you're doing very well. There, so there are people who on all sides, I mean, I have a CPA firm here. My, you know, I'm a partner to a firm. Um, we, when, of course, when there is income of cash, you don't just go and spend it out crazy like if there is no tomorrow. You know, there is pragmatism. You have to ensure that, you know, whatever decision you make, it's, it's, it's good. But if we can go back, in the Burnham years, Guyana went bankrupt. Now, I don't know if they were spending too much. I really didn't do a research on that, but we know he declared bankruptcy. Desmond Hoyt came on the scene and he brought some normalcy to the situation. I think Guyana got back in its foot um, with with um, um, Carl Greenwich um, going around the world to try to re reprogram our debt and so on. The PEP took over and they continued that. But at the end of 2015, when the PEP left office, there was substantial revenue in the in the coffers. They were like $20 billion in the current account balance of the Bank of Guyana. They had about $14 billion in gold reserve. They had about six month reserve in imports, I um, mean, foreign currency. Now, the Treasury, the Bank of Guyana reports saying that they have a deficit of about $80 billion. Um, the gold reserve has gone down to below a billion dollars. Our foreign currency reserve is about three months of import product. What is going on with the administration of cash? in a perceived PNC administration. Floyd, you can help us here. Um, I don't know enough about the specifics. Um, I'm told that um, the Treasury is broke, and I'm told that the, the foreign reserves have um, been depleted significantly. Uh, what I will say is that all of this ties back to leadership. Um, Plain and simple. I think we've misplaced, we've put very talented people in the wrong places. And I didn't get the sense that we understood the science of nation building and nation management and those types of things. And when you go into a, a job, as you well know, and you don't, you're not well prepared to take on the responsibilities of those, of those jobs, you find yourself in these situations. It's not, it's not um, hard to see how we could end up in this situation. Mismanagement, bad leadership. Tim, what do you think causing this problem in Guyana and area of finances? It's a combination of factors. I, I think it's simplistic just to say, oh, we had $10 in the account and now we have zero. Um, a country doesn't run just on what you've got in the bank account. 
um, there are, there's a lot more at play. Um, if I can draw an analogy under Andrew Jackson in the States, for the first time back in the 1800s, he was determined to get rid of the national debt, and he did. And the country went into serious decline. Because a country's economy is not about how much money it has in the bank. It's about how confident the investors are and how well the money is circulating in the economy. Um, so you've got to look at it that way. Now, you mentioned a few of the issues that arose, but you've got to look at it in terms of a lot of factors getting involved. You're right, Burnham destroyed our economy. I, I see party loyalists saying Burnham was good for Ghana, Burnham was needed. Burnham was a dictator who didn't understand economics. He nationalized because it was popular at the time. Although Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore did the opposite and really, really benefited. Having nationalized, he put people in charge of the sugar industry and the bauxite industry and the other industries that he nationalized that didn't know anything about running a business. And he put family and friends and they put family and friends and everything grown to a halt. The few foreign investors that came, he treated them so shabbily that they left and we became a pariah in term in commercial terms. Hoyt had a very difficult job turning that around, but he did a remarkably good job. His economic recovery programs um, were based on encouraging foreign investment. He brought in Barama, he brought in the Mar Timbers, he brought in Omai, he brought in GTNT. He began to regalvanize the economy by helping the infrastructure, improving telecommunications, trying to build some roads, trying to encourage um, housing and that kind of thing. He had a difficult job because no one wanted to invest. He floated the currency, which made, made local labor cheaper in terms of hard currency and therefore made it better for foreign investors coming because they weren't spending too much on labor. Omai transformed the country because oil royalties um, Barama transformed the timber industry, timber royalties. Money started to come in, and as you say, Carl Greenwich went, went around the world trying to get loan forgiveness. IMF took us back into the fold. Chedi Jagan, to his credit, continued Hoyt's policies, and Chedi also continued the policy which I think um, was his single, single greatest contribution, which was housing. So Chedi developed Echoes and then developed other housing schemes. And what's happened, unlike the Barnum administration, which wanted to build a condominium and give you a ready-made slum, he just gave you land so that immediately you had an equity that was worth money. You could take that equity to the bank and use it as collateral to borrow money, build a house. You had probably the pride of ownership. A lot more wealth was immediately available and generated. When the sugar estate started to close, um, the workers on the sugar estates went into the construction sector. People like Eddie Boyer started making money because hardware and construction um, goods became in demand. Um, more roads were built so that that galvanized the economy and had things spinning, had, had money turning around. The other two things that we don't like to talk about that have nothing to do with economic policy are the fact that when China came, became more capitalist, 2005, 2006, 2007, when they built their three rivers, reverse dam and that kind of thing, price of gold shot up so that our gold industry immediately became the largest foreign exchange earner, outstripping sugar, outstripping timber. That was the first. And the second thing we don't like to talk about is drugs. The drug trade helped us. Um, as Venezuela tightened up under Chavez, more drugs came over from Colombia because our borders are porous and we became one of the largest drug exporters from South America. Lots of money in that. Gold began to decline 2012-2013 and our economy began to decline 2012-2013. No, let's pretend it happened under Apnu. It happened it, the trend was happening before that. Um, with the downfall of Chavez, Venezuela's borders were more porous and a lot more drugs started going out through Venezuela. They didn't have to come over to Guyana to be exported from Guyana. So a lot of our drug barons, you saw, became bankrupt. They started, had cash flow problems. They started borrowing money, couldn't pay the bank their debts. We saw it happening. So we have to acknowledge what happened and we have to understand holistically what was going on. Things have leveled off, but the fact that you don't have money in the account is not the only indicator of bad management. There has been bad management. 
We've had the largest public sector. We've had the largest overburdened government. Granger has brought all his army cronies back into the country and paid them super salaries. I've never seen such a large bureaucracy in government and all of them doing nothing at all. They cannot point to a single economic policy in the last five years, but they can say they chased away Barama, closed down Gaisuko, um, and, and have been systematically destroying all our avenues of foreign exchange earning. They've increased taxes. And when you speak to the government ministers, and I've spoken to some of them, their response is them people got plenty of money, they could pay tax. <laughs> and if that is your economic policy, well, we're doomed to failure, and that's what's happened now. So it's a combination of events, but we have to understand it holistically so that we can develop an economic policy to move forward. I have challenged party loyalists on both sides. What's the economic policy of your party that you are most proud of, you think was most successful? And there's usually silence as a re as in a response. Timothy, um, Bibi just mentioned, well said, my boy. Um, I never knew you were so. I never knew you were so um, knowledgeable in the finances that you've just said there, and I, I'm so impressed with foreign policy and finance. That makes a good leader, and I hope that one day we'll see President Timothy Jonas um, leading our country. Um, gentlemen, it's wrapping up time now. Um, I know we had a really nice session. Um, so we know what what happened. How did we get here? So now what? What do we do? Um, <laughs> Floyd, in, tell us what what you think we should do, and in closing, tell us what you what you think Diana should be. Um, hopefully, we should get this thing over quickly, and we'll have a functioning country in the not too distant future. Well, I'll, I'll end with a quote from Shakespeare in Hamlet. Uh, it says, assume a virtue if you have it not, and it will lend an easiness to the next abstinence. And I say as to all of the people that are playing the games, assume the virtue. Concede, let's get a government in place, and let's begin the job of rebuilding this country. It's going to be a lot of work to be done. But it starts first with a government in place, a legitimate government. And then we can go about the business. Um, you know, I've always thought Guyana have had leaders, lots of leaders. But I don't think we've had much leadership. And I like to draw a distinction. You see, leadership, it's, it's an act. It's the act of bringing people together to solve their problems, mobilizing people to face and tackle the tough problems. And when you use that as the measure of leadership, when you, when you use the progress on problems as a measure, I would put the question to anybody, where have we seen or who has exercised that kind of leadership? I haven't seen much of it. And I, you know, I, I think we have to be able to aspire and demand a different type of leadership and only the people can do that you see oftentimes we if we continue to look to politicians and our smart friends in the diaspora and wherever we're never going to solve our, our problems no problem that's imposed on guyana or on the guyanese people from the outside will work um uh, it's never done it's never been that way in any country in any organization people solve their problems <laughs> What leadership does is provide the enabling environment so that those people and give them the tools that they can solve their problems. And that's what I hope a new government would do. Are you think they will be inclusive? I mean, as they ought to be? They have said that to me and I believe them. I give them the benefit of the doubt. And if they're not, I would be on your show speaking out against it. Okay, well, okay, thank you. Timothy, um, as we said, we know how we got, well, we know how we get here, but we are here. Um, what do we do next in your closing? Again, it's, it's hard to improve on what Floyd said. I agree with him. We have not had leaders. We've had people who try to control. And they try, they try to control in the most petty, small ways, let alone in the big ways. 
And it doesn't work like that. Your leaders are there to create an enabling environment so that the creativity and ingenuity of the Guyanese people can be put to work in their own interest to carve out their own businesses, to develop their own professions, to make their own money and to live their lives because the people are sovereign. Government should not be our largest employer. No. Government is our largest employer. We shouldn't be hidebound to Gaisuko. But Gaisuko has been employing thousands and thousands of people all under the thumb of the government. That needs to change. We need to encourage foreign investment. We need to honor our contracts with our foreign investors and make good contracts. We need to understand that the days of Guyanese being second class citizens are over. Guyanese, if we manage this country well, will be first class citizens and foreigners will be coming here to work for us. We can change our tax structure. In five years, Guyanese shouldn't be paying income tax. Guyanese shouldn't be paying tax on vehicles, but foreigners should be coming here to work and they should be paying income tax. Singapore has a population that nearly half of it is foreigners who have gone to Singapore to work in Singapore and they work for Singaporeans. That is where we are going to be if we are well managed, but we are not going to be there if a dictatorship takes over and we're not going to be there unless we get over this ethnic divide and start empowering the people. So we need to have strict laws about citizenship. We need to have strict laws about education and free education for Guyanese. We need to be spending our oil money on building bridges and roads and um, railways and improving the infrastructure on dams and on hydroelectricity and solar electricity. And we need to create an environment with that infrastructure that Guyanese can invest and work and be fruitful and enjoy life. That's what we need to be doing. I hope you're not talking about Floyd and I being those foreigners coming to Guyana to work for you guys, right? You don't mean that. Guyanese is anybody I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it has been a very interesting program tonight. And as um, as, as he mentioned, you know, um, it'll be a very interesting conversation. Um, and again, we I, every time we meet on a Monday, we're saying that, you know, this thing will come to an end. Um, I don't perceive this coming to an end before next Monday because if as the um, government, that, well, not the government, but the um, the filer um, attorney says they're going to the uh, Court of Appeal, and as Tim mentioned, that might take a couple of days, and then hopefully they will hear it, and maybe next week there'll be a, a ruling, and then maybe from that we'll go to the CCJ, and that's another couple of weeks. Um, so it seems as though there is no end in sight. If, Tim, in clo before we be quite close, if the Court of Appeal says they will not take this case, what happened then? They can't say that they won't take the, the case. There is an appeal as of right from any judicial review application made at first instance. So they don't need leave to appeal. They go straight to Court of Appeal as of right. But what they can do is they can very quickly, as Justice George did, require submissions and throw it out. And that's what they need to do because there's absolutely no merit in any appeal. I got you. Okay, so hopefully they can do that within another week or so. And then, and I don't think if- Well, as I said, with our court of appeal, sometimes you have to flip a coin. Mm. <laughs> and um, I, if that happens, then I don't think that if, if they throw it out, that the government side will go to the CCJ because they know that will be a thrown out case there as well. Um, so we hope that some sanity... Well, Charles, I don't think it's about getting the correct result. I think it's yeah. about how much time you can spend getting it. But as you said, and many people said, is that they're losing more of the support base when they continue with this craziness, knowing that they've lost the election. Their support base is telling them, hey, cool down, give up. Listen to, listen to Dominic. Say, hey, get a you way know? out. Tell you know, people the truth and wait for the next election. You know, Charles, um, it, it's also a question of enforcement, right? You know, here in the States, you can go to court, you can get a judgment, but you can't collect. And so in the context of these elections, how are we going to collect? Mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard that answered at all in anywhere yeah. by anyone. <laughs> That's a bigger problem than you think it is. Getting the judgment is one thing. How do you collect? 
Good point. And Tim Tari is saying, Jonas is right, Guyana could be the next Dubai. I'm not sure we can be Dubai, but we can be near there. And then our, us foreigners will come work for you Guyanese uh, and pay our taxes. So again, I want to thank you, Tim, for taking your evening and spending with us. To you, um, Floyd, thank you so much for accepting the invitation to be here with us. And we look forward to um, some sanity taking place in Guyana. And we are appealing to Mr. Granger, sir, you are the president. You can bring this to an end. You can bring it an end tomorrow, tonight. You can actually, uh, um, you know, concede your, you've lost the election and let the um, new president be sworn in. It's up to you, sir. Thank you. We can only pray and hope that that happens. So thank gentlemen, you. to our viewers out there, to Noir Singh and to Devin, we want to thank you so much. To our viewers, Take care. God bless you until the next time. God bless. Take, Take care, Tim. It was a Take pleasure. Care. Floyd, it was a pleasure chatting politics with you after a long, long time. Definitely, <laughs> man. <laughs>